So I'm going to show you some Stone Age tools today. We'll go right back to the beginning. So there were the three Stone Ages, the P, the M, and the N. What were they? So the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic. So we'll start with the Paleolithic. Now this, yes, it's a piece of stone. And it, if you're out dog walking or something, you might think it's just a piece of stone, but an expert would look at the shape of it, the pear shape, and they'd also look at the little lines. Can you see the little lines along here? And this is where it's been struck, and probably struck by, first of all, another large stone, and then when they wanted to get it sharper and more accurate cutting edges on it, they would hit it with, what's this? This is a piece of antler. Antler from, which grows on, on, obviously on the head of deer. So they would either be hunting the deer and cut the antler off, or wait for the antlers to drop off, as they do, because deer shed their antlers. And then this is, you see it's hollow, because it has to be light, because it, it goes on the deer's head. If you imagine if this was very heavy, or was on a deer's head, it would weigh the deer down. So it's very clever construction in, in nature, where it's grown. Can you see, it's kind of a honeycomb there. So it's got lots and lots of air holes in it, but it's still very, very strong. Now, humans must have looked at this in the past because if you look at big buildings or aeroplanes, they are sometimes at the top, they're very light, but very strong. Particularly if an aeroplane's wing will be full of lots of gaps, but lots of strong structure, just like a deer's antler. Now, Stone Age people, they use this for all sorts of things. They could use it for digging, if it had big spikes on it. Sometimes antlers have spikes for raking, but we definitely know they did use it for, oh, a little bit blurry there, sorry, for making their stone tools. That process is called napping, and they would, when, they're, when they've they bashed two stones together to get them into the basic shape, and then to get them into the right shape, into the finished shape, they would go, I'm going to do this, not very properly, because I don't want to break this thing I've got in my hand, but they go bash, 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 and when you can see, you see the little mark there? That's where thousands of years ago, because this is the Paleolithic, so this might be 30,000 years ago, thousands of years ago, somebody with a tool hit that on there to try to make that nice sharp edge. Now this is a hand axe, because in the Paleolithic they haven't worked out how to put a handle on it yet. Can you imagine that? There's, they haven't worked out how to put a stick on it yet. So you would hold this in your hand, if you're alive, thousands of years ago, and you could chop with it, and you could cut with it, and you could scrape with it. Now today, it's perfectly smooth because it's so old. It's been in the ground for tens of thousands of years. But when it was first made, if I did that, I would now be bleeding. I would have cut my hand. So this is the tool that did everything. Now you notice I'm saying tool, and I'm not saying weapon. Some people look at these things and they start talking about weapons. Well, we don't really have any evidence that Stone Age people were very fierce and were fighting each other. They were just very good at hunting. Now there weren't, my theory, is that my, my thinking is that there weren't very many people around in Stone Age times. Today in Britain, there's 62 million people live in Britain. But in Stone Age times, there were a few thousand. Now, if they all ran around with these things, and they were hitting each other and maybe killing each other, then they'd all die out. And they can't have died out because you and I are the great, 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 well, you can get, guess how many greats, it's lots and lots of greats, but we are the descendants, we are the grandchildren of Stone Age people. So there's no way that they went around killing each other with these stone tools. So that's a good start. That's the Paleolithic, and that's the hand axe held in the hand and made by another stone, and, and then the antler knocking, knocking, knocking to make the sharp edges. So the first tools in the world that people made were these. So I'm holding something that's tens of thousands of years old. A few more Stone Age tools for you. So this one. This is, can you guess what it is? Well, it used to have this edge here, along here, try and get it in focus for you on the camera. That edge there used to be very, very sharp. Again, I would have just cut my finger. This was a knife. And now that's a very silly question. What would you use a knife for? Well, they were using knives for exactly the same thing as us. Except, of course, they weren't cutting open their Amazon delivery parcels with it. So that would be you imagine that they found it in a field and they thought, well, that's a fairly good shape, but then they would knock, knock, knock and take off all the wobbly soft edges until it's quite sharp. And then again, with, the, with our antler, piece of antler, knock, knock, knock to make a really nice sharp edge. And then everything that you would use a knife for, they would use a knife for house making, um, cutting up firewood, cutting up bits of things for dinner, cutting up things for uh, maybe making some thread, all sorts of things. Very good tool, that one. Um, 
if it gets a little bit blunt and they really like this tool, they want to keep this tool, not to throw it away and make another one, they would possibly use something like this. Now this looks very, ooh. Oh, it's very out of focus. There you go. Just let the camera catch up. The cap camera has to think about things before it can go into focus. Now, can you see the shine? Oh, there you go. I'm catching the sunlight. This is a piece of Stone Age tool. It looks like just a rock you might find in a river. But the experts have found out, because there's lots of people who are experts in stones, that because it's got this, just this very shiny top here, this was used for sharpening stones. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to do it properly because all of the things I'm showing you are real Stone Age things, and so I can't scratch them or break them in any way. But if this is getting a little bit blunt, they would rub that hard on top of that stone, and eventually this would get sharper and sharper. Sometimes people say Stone Age people, or they lived in caves, and they just said, ugh, ugh, not very clever at all. But I'm going to show you that actually they did know what they were doing, and actually they were quite clever people. And if you think about it, we all live in Salisbury. How many caves do you know? How many times have you been to a cave in or near Salisbury? There aren't any. So they weren't actually cave people at all. Sometimes they used caves, yes. But usually they would build a shelter or find somewhere to live that wasn't a cave. So there's our sharpening stone and the knife. And then sometime, when they develop from the Paleolithic, when they move forward in time and they got a little bit cleverer and cleverer with their technology, they would actually start to make very, very polished stones. So this was a rough shape just like this. And what they've done is they've rubbed and rubbed and rubbed against one of these. Just wait for the camera to focus. Come on, camera. Until, can you see just how smooth that is and how smooth that edge is? That's the cutting edge. And this is a real Stone Age axe, a very small one, but it's never actually been used for chopping because if it was used for chopping, it would have lots of little dents along there, the blade would be a little bit used and broken. So we think that because this is so well polished, there's a little bit missing there, but it's so well polished, this was something that they treasured, they looked after, it was one of their favorite best things. And we also think that because of that, it was maybe, maybe used for trading. What do I mean by that? It was used for swapping. So for example, I have this, and somebody lives nearby me, and they've got a goat. And I think, well, that, I really like that goat because I like the meat or the skin of the goat or the milk from the goat. So I could go to my friend who has the goat and I could say, look at this object. Would you like me to swap this for your goat? And if they said yes, I would walk away with the goat and they'd walk away with this lovely object. And then they had this lovely object in their pocket and you can see what, see what happens next. They then see somebody who has a, a pig and the story continues. So. What would you use? You wouldn't go into a shop with one of these today. What would you go into a shop with today? And if you saw something, a bar of chocolate in the shop, what would you give the person in the shop for the chocolate? So you can see, maybe you could say that Stone Age people were already thinking about some kind of money. I say that very loosely because this is not Stone Age money. There was not such a thing. But they did have an idea of nice things that you could swap for other things. Some people would say that £20 is a nice thing. You can swap for other things. There you go. So it's a very, very lovely um, Stone Age tool. We moved on. Oh, I talked about animals earlier on, chopping up animals. This is a love. It's got, a, it's got, oh, come on, Larry. Come on, camera. You can do it. It's got beachy head written on it. Come on, camera. Wakey, wakey. There you go. Camera's working up. It's got beachy head written. Sometimes things, when they come into the museum, they have where they come from written on them in, with little paint, little paint handwriting, very neatly. Or sometimes they have a number on them. And that's the name of the object, so we can record where it's come from and we can keep a track on what the object is. So this one is called Beachy Head because, because it comes from a place called Beachy Head. Now what is it? Let's look at it. It's round-ish. It did have, it used to have, thousands of years ago, a very sharp edge on it, really sharp. That sharp edge, can you see all the little little nicks come out of it. Again, back to our antler. Knock, knock, knock. Let's make this edge very, very sharp. Maybe grind, grind, make it even sharper. And it's round. And archaeologists do find quite a few of these around, so you have to keep your eyes open when you go out for a walk. Can you guess what it was used for? This is for scraping. Hmm, scraping what? This is where I have to get a little bit horrible history, I'm afraid. I might upset the vegetarians listening to this, because when you've killed your animal, and you have your animal for uh, lunch, so you can cut up your animal with your knife, and you have a yum yum Stone Age lunch. 
But then you look at the, the fleece, the fur, the skin on the animal, and you think, actually, that would be really useful. Because uh, I could wear that, it could be a hat or a jacket or some shoes to stop my feet from catching on all the sharp things in the ground. So you cut off the skin off the animal. I did warn you, this is horrible history, but it's history, it's true. And then, of course, you might not want the fur on the outside, or you definitely would not want all the blood and the guts on the inside, so you've got to scrape it off. That's what this was used for. It was used for scraping the skin on the inside and the outside of the animal to get everything you didn't want. You don't want to be wearing yuch. Clean all that off, and then you could stretch out the skin on a nice sunny day and dry it, and then you can wear it, turn it into something to go on your feet, or your head, or, your, or a jacket, or something like that. So it's a scraper. Not a very nice um, thing really, but a very useful tool because you're making all your own clothes in the Stone Age. You have a, a lovely scraper. And we moved along in technology. So we're moving into the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone Age. And look what we've done. So we started with our Paleolithic hand axe. And now we're into the Mesolithic. Look what we've done to the stone. Well, this is replica wood. It's not real Stone Age wood. Why is it not Stone Age wood? And this is a piece of leather around here to help keep the stone in. This is not Stone Age leather. Why is it not Stone Age leather? And then what they've done very clever, they've made a hole in the piece of wood and they pushed the stone through. They have then glued it. They did have glue. Back to what I say about Stone Age people were not stupid. They had limited technology, but they knew what they were doing. They would. Have you ever leant against a tree, maybe in the summer, Lent against the trunk of a tree, and then you've walked away and you've gone, Ugh, I've got something sticky on my hand or on my, on my arm where I was leaning on the tree. Sometimes trees ooze a kind of sap, which is incredibly sticky. It's really tricky to get off once you've, once you've got it on your skin. Well, Stone Age people worked out, they took some of that and they mixed it with some ash from the fire, and then they mixed it with some, some wax, funnily enough, and then where do they get wax from? Any ideas? Buzz, buzz, buzz. Buzz, buzz, buzz. They knew all about bees. They would know where to find wild bees. And they'd know how to get, take the honey away from the bees. So they, they got some sugar. Clever Stone Age people. But they'd also, of course, find the wax. The honeycomb that the um, honey comes in is wax. So they take the wax and they mix the wax and the ash and the sticky sap from the tree. And they heat it up in a bonfire until it's uh, about 300 degrees. So not terribly hot. And then that makes a really good glue. And they would put that in the gap between the stone and the wood. And that's a really strong glue. Now, people today have tested this glue because they found tiny pieces of it from the past and they've made some new today and they've tested it and they've worked out that it's stronger than most of the glues that you can buy in the shop today. Really, really strong stuff. So we've got, if we've been out to the woods and we found a nice strong piece of wood and we put a hole in it and then we squeezed our stone through it so it's nice and stuck with some glue and then just to be doubly sure, we put some leather strap on it. And now we've got an axe and we can swing the axe. Now swinging the axe, when you do science about pivots and things like that, swinging, actually you get more force in something if you swing it. And also, I'm holding it there and I'm not going to bash my hand on anything because my hand is away from the action point. So my hand is safe. And it's probably easier on my hand than holding rough stone because I've got a nice handle. I still might wear a piece of leather around it or something to keep my hand safe. But now I can swing. I had to hold this one, the Paleolithic one, in my hand. So I may have used a piece of leather, but that would have been hard work and hard on my hands. But now I can swing my axe for chopping that tough tree down to make, to make that river crossing. I want to chop that big tree trunk down so it falls across the river, so I can walk across the river. I don't have to swim across the river. So Mesolithic, we're getting cleverer and cleverer now. We've put a handle. This is called a hafted axe. It means it's got a handle on it, hafted. There we are. Now we're in the middle of Stone Age, the Mesolithic. And did you know, Stone Age people enjoyed eating lots of bread. Their bread would be flat bread, not fluffy bread, but flat bread, very thin. So imagine pitta bread or naan bread, something like that, very flat bread. Now they, because they didn't know how to make it fluffy yet, but they did know how to make bread. Where do you get the basic ingredient for bread from? What is it? It is, of course, flour. A flower comes from grain, and grain come, grows like a grass in, on the ground. Now, how do you, do you have to go and rip it out of the ground with your hand? Well, maybe you do, if you haven't got any tools at all. And then you have to squash, grind the grain, and turn it into a flower, and then you can make your bread. But 
Mesolithic, the clever Mesolithic people, when they were breaking up their big tools, they noticed that little pieces were falling off. And those little pieces are very sharp. What can we do with those? Well, if you find a piece of wood with a little hole in it, a, sl a slit in it, you can push those very small, sharp pieces of flint. Come on, Mr. Camera, see if you can focus. You can pu push those little, little pieces of flint into the gap, and then, with our amazing glue that I've told you about, you can push that in, and you've got... Now, I'm going to be careful, because this is a replica. It's not Stone Age wood, and these are not Stone Age pieces of stone. So these are very sharp still. You can push them into there, and what you have now is a sickle. Can you see the funny shape? So you'd find a naturally growing piece of wood that's bent like that. You wouldn't have to bend it, you'd just find it lying, growing in a tree or lying on the ground. And then, there's our, our grass is growing like that, and you go, chop, and the grass falls down. Chop, and the grass falls down. So you've got a sickle. Stone Age technology, they're being very clever. They're, they're working out how to best harvest their crop. What would you use today? You'd use a combine harvester. If you've seen them in July and August, driving across the fields day and night before it rains, so they've got to get all the grain in. Great big combine harvesters that go, they have hundreds of blades and they go chop, 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 and they pull it into the machine and then they separate the, the stems, the straw from the grain, and then they collect the grain and take it away and do all sorts of amazing things with it, make your breakfast with it. So there you are, there's a sickle. And what we should talk about a little bit more is hunting. So can you guess what's in the box? It's a funny shape. It's a leaf shape, and that's, it's actually called a leaf shape thing. What is it? So I'll bring it up to the camera a bit. Oh, and it's got the word Ireland on it, because this was found in Ireland, so somebody very carefully wrote the name Ireland on it. Can you? By looking at the go around, it's quite sharp. Little lumps. Somebody made this. Can you see how small it is? There's my thumbs. How tiny it is. This is an arrowhead. So you'd have this, the stick of the arrow would be going down here, out of shot. Zoop, like that. And that would be the pointy end. And then you'd fire that through the air off your bow. Let's do this animation. Woo! Like that. Oh, a bit blurry. And it would hopefully hit your animal because. Chance of you being a vegetarian in Stone Age times not very high because you want some dinner. So it's flying through the air and it hits the deer, kills the deer, and that means you're happy because you've got something to eat. Um, so here we are. It's the arrowhead. So they've, they've, again, they found a lump of stone just like these ones here, and they've knocked it and knocked it, and then probably they got, when they got smaller and smaller, then, then they used the antler and knocking it, knocking it, and all the edges are very sharp and the point of it's very sharp. And then they put it on the end of a stick using our glue clever, clever people, and then they'd go out hunting and they'd shoot it and it would go into the animal. Now this is leaf shaped, so I'm going I'm to be a little bit horrible history as well because we need to talk about the technology. This is leaf shaped, so it goes into the animal very easily, Eesh, like that. But also, because it's round shaped like that, it also does sometimes fall out, which means the animal can run away. So that's, that's your dinner has gone. What you really want, now this is all a bit horrible, but I do have to tell you this because it's, it's all about history and technology. So what you really want is the arrow to stick into the animal and stay in the animal and the animal to run off because then it's got a great big arrow sticking out of it and that's going to slow it down so you can run after it and you can finish off the job. You can kill it or you can catch it or it, it, might, get, it might try to run through a bush and get stuck because it's got an arrow sticking out of it. So you've got better chance of having dinner. So this was quite good but they needed to improve it because they needed to make it so that it did not fall out of the animal. So I'll put this one down and I'll show you what they did next. So the first ones were the leaf shaped ones we've just seen and then as the Stone Age went on they got cleverer and cleverer and in this little box here come on camera, come on Mr. Camera you can do this focus focus, can you see the shape there? Well, this is the shape. This is called tanged and barbed. Now the bits, the edge bits, one and two, the bits that stick down, they're the barbs and then tanged is the bit in the middle. So our wooden arrow stick goes on the um, tanged bit, the bit in the middle, and then the barbs stick out either side of the arrow. So, this is a bit yucky, but there you go. We're flying through the air, we've shot the arrow, flying through the air, it hits the, the deer or the animal, and it goes, it goes right in because you, you pulled the arrow and it's flying really fast, it goes right into the animal. And because it's got the barbs on it, 
it doesn't fall out. So the animal runs along and the arrow is not going to fall out and there's much more of a chance of you finishing the job and getting the animal and getting your dinner and maybe your new hat and maybe your new shoes because you've got a, a, you killed a deer. So this is all made by Stone Age people. Look at that, look how tiny it is. And they just, just did that by knocking a stone and an antler against this and making this amazing, slightly blurry, sorry the camera work's not great because I've only got two hands. Come on camera, come on camera. Come on camera, you can do it. It's amazing, there we go. Amazing arrowhead, tanged and barbed. Gonna finish with my favorite handling object. Now it's a ra it is a piece of stone, it's a ramble. It's got, do you remember we said about painting things on the uh, people in the museum and the archeologists paint things on? Got a little number two, don't know whether I can pick that up. The camera's getting a little bit confused now. Confused camera, they just about make out a red number two. This is a piece of real Stonehenge. And I'm allowed to have it in my handling collection at the museum, which is amazing because at Salisbury Museum, we have lots and lots of things from Stonehenge. You see what color it is? It's kind of a blue color. So it's nicknamed Bluestone. It's actually called, called the real science name is it's called Spotted, because it's got the little white dots in it. Spotted Dolorite. Dolorite is the name of the stone. Now this piece of stone came all the way from Wales. And this is in the time of the Stone Age. So how did they get stone all the way from the south of Wales, which is about 150 miles from Stonehenge? How did they get it from there to Stonehenge? This is where you're waiting for me to tell you the answer. And all I can tell you is nobody knows. There are lots of mysteries about Stonehenge. And one of the big mysteries is how did they get these blue stones from Wales to Stonehenge? Now this is a tiny piece. This would have arrived at Stonehenge attached to as a part of a very big piece, a piece that weighed about a ton. So that's um, nearly as much as a normal sized car. So Stone Age people, they haven't got trains, they haven't got big boats, they've got boats but they haven't got big boats, uh, they haven't got cars, they managed to get this all the way from South Wales and take it to Stonehenge. So what happened was they would collect some large lumps of stone in sort of rectangle shapes but a little bit rough and they'd move them somehow to Stonehenge when they arrived at Stonehenge, they would then carve them into the perfect rectangle shapes that you see them there today, when you visit today. And they did that by knocking stone against stone, because it's the Stone Age, that's what they did. And when they knocked off big lumps of stone, off the, off the large lumps that they want to keep, those, those smaller lumps that fall off the large lumps, they can use those as hammers. So what they do is sometimes the, the stones would be this big, and then, some, and then they would go knock, knock, knock until the stones were getting smaller and so the hammer stones were getting smaller and smaller against the big stones and the big stones were turning into the correct rectangle shape that they wanted. And they would carry on knocking until the hammer stones they were using, can you see, I've got, so I've got a grown up hand and now this stone has been knocked against the big stones so many times and it's lost so many bits, it's actually too small for me to use as a hammer because if I start using it as a hammer now, I'm going to hurt my fingers. So it's no good as a hammer. But the clever Stone Age people did not want to waste it because the next thing to do is to dig a hole, a foundation for the stone that they've made, the rectangle stone. So they dig a nice big hole and then they get the rectangle stone to stand up in the hole. Again, we don't know how they did that. Nobody actually really knows how they made the stones stand up and stand into, inside the holes. But they stood them in the hole. And then, because the hole was a little bit bigger than they needed so that they could drop the stone in, the standing up stone, which is now my hand, would be a little bit wiggly because it's in a hole that's a little bit too big. It's like you standing in a pair of shoes that are too big for you. You're a little bit wiggly. So you need to feel the shoes. What would you do? You'd probably wear lots of extra socks. Well, in this case, they've got lots of bits of broken stone lying around. And so with all the bits of broken stone that they didn't need anymore, they would throw those broken stones down into the hole against the sides of the stone, the big stone that they just put in there, and it would stop the big stone from wobbling, and then they might top it off with some soil maybe to make it look tidy. And then, so that's how they made the stones stand up straight and stop falling over. If you visit Stonehenge today, you're not allowed to touch Stonehenge because they don't want lots and lots of greasy fingers all over it. So I'm very lucky to have this in the handling collection. A real piece of Stonehenge that originally somehow came from Wales and then was used to, hop, to knock Stonehenge into the right shape, and then it was used to make Stonehenge stand up straight. And now it's in the museum and people like me can touch it. 
and touch something that a person made over 3,000 years ago. Isn't that amazing? So that's my final object. These are the, all the objects. I'm going to take some photographs now, so you can have some photographs up on your whiteboard if you want to. But I hope you've enjoyed listening to me talking for 20 minutes. Ah, that's a long time. About all these lovely Stone Age things from Salisbury Museum. Thank you very much. Bye.